Okay, everybody. Uh, thank you once again to everybody at NOSAS and James in particular for inviting me, setting up this lecture that we did over the weekend. It was a real nice time and it was the first time for me uh, doing a lecture and then getting birthday cake straight after. So that was a wonderful evening. Thanks to everybody for their brilliant conversation. Um, the recording didn't work on the night, so uh, I didn't want it to, 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 to let it go to waste uh, for the members who couldn't be there. So here we are. I'm re-recording it, but it allows me to sort of do this little happy birthday message. All right. So enjoy the week, everybody. Uh, and congratulations again to NOSAS. All right, here goes. My name is Adrian Maldonado, I'm Galloway Horde Researcher, National Museum Scotland, uh, and this is a little uh, a story about things that I've been working on for the last few years now. I joined the National Museum in 2018 as Glenn Morangy Research Fellow, uh, and the gig there was specifically to sort of write the next volume in this brilliant series of books sponsored by the Glen Morangy Company as part of their Glen Morangy Research Project. It's been going on since 2008. Uh, it's uh, the uh, the sort of origin, the inception of it was the rebranding in 2008 that Glen Morangy did where they choose a little bit of the, uh, uh, the, the little panel of Pictish art from the lower register of the Hilton Cadbull Stone, which is on the Glen Morangy estate or was. And... Uh, and at that point, they fund research at the National Museum. Uh, the project goes from strength to strength until it uh, runs until uh, this fourth phase, which resulted in the book Crucible of Nations. The point of that book was to take the story uh, into the Viking Age. Uh, it, it, basically, they let me loose on the collections for three years. Anything from the 9th to the 12th century was fair game. Uh, it was a great time. Uh, it was definitely like learning a new language, being in the museum, writing about the Viking Age. But I think uh, there's some really interesting stories that came out of it. The story I'm going to tell today is about the objects from the northern mainland of Scotland uh, relating to that. And it also relates to sort of my time uh, in the museum as well. Uh, early in the pandemic in 2020, I gave uh, uh, a Zoom lecture, one of my first, to uh, NOSAS. Uh, and it was about the Croy Horde. Uh, and that was, I thought it was really important then. And then the more uh, I thought about it, the more we looked at it, the more discoveries came out. So uh, this will be a kind of a return to a previous lecture from a few years ago. So uh, uh, without further ado, let's get to it. Okay. So the time period I'm talking about is uh, from the 9th century to the 12th century. We traditionally call that the Viking Age. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot going on other than just Vikings. And in certain parts of the country, there's very few Vikings around anyway. And so is the Viking Age really the best word for it? Well, we don't really have another really good uh, uh, word for it, really. It's the end of the millennium, the central part of the medieval period. Uh, and at the beginning of it, in the north, the big story is the kingdom of Fortru, and they're based around the Murray Firth, but their power extends across northern Britain, even beyond the sort of bounds of what we now call Scotland uh, uh, to a certain extent. And the, uh, the the sort of key evidence for this is this installation in southern Pictland in the heart of the Strathern Valley, and this is a, what's now a rural village in Perthshire at Fort Teviot. But in the early part of the ninth century, uh, there's nothing normal about this place. It has been a ceremonial gathering place for thousands of years since the Neolithic. Uh, there's ancient monuments scattered across the fields. And in the beginning of the ninth century, uh, the Pictish king Constantine uh, decides to really ramp up the ceremonial aspect of this, the gatherings here, and seems to have built a palace. Uh, and all that's left of it is this uh, massive stone arch, which is now on display in the National Museum. And you can see what appears to be uh, King Constantine himself there on the left, the larger figure, uh, dressed in togas, you know, with this sort of classicizing view. Uh, but there's him also on the right, the rider on that horse. And we know that because the reverse of the Dublin cross bears an inscription commemorating Constantine. So 
we're pretty sure this man with his lovely curled hair and his gigantic Pictish mustache on the horse and on the arch is the same figure. And what's interesting is that they're here on the arch, which must have belonged to a church or an arch maybe of a palace, a large stone structure of which this is the only thing that remains. It shows the ambitions of the Picts at the start of the Viking Age. They were top of the heap. Not only that, they were doing this sort of classicizing art, things like the St. Andrew's sarcophagus, David imagery, biblical imagery on stone, and things like this for T. Reed Arch, all are showing their aspirations. They are They want to be seen as on par with the Roman emperors, you know, uh, on the par with the kings of Francia, Charlemagne uh, and his sons are currently uh, in power on the continent. And the Picts are aspiring to a similar kind of status. And I think we can kind of take them at their word. Certainly in the, by the beginning of the ninth century, uh, they are the sort of big players in the North. Of course, Things change quickly in the course of the ninth century. The first Viking raid uh, in Britain uh, in 789, quickly then thereafter at Lindisfarne in 793, and then again in Iona 795. So the Viking raids start thick and fast at the end of the eighth century. Uh, and then in one particular place in Northern Pickland, here again at the heart of the kingdom of Fortrue, the heart of the kingdom, there's this monastery which is otherwise undocumented. No historical record mentions a church here, but the excavations by Martin Carver, uh, Cecily Spall, and others uh, um, show how large and how important this site was. It's just an accident of history that it was not sort of uh, that that records of it don't survive. Uh, massive establishment, uh, possibly one of the earliest surviving churches uh, from Scotland that you can still see and touch uh, in the crypt of uh, St. Coleman's there. But what you're looking at here is this plan of the excavation, uh, this open area of the excavation, which shows this black burnt layer all across it. There was a catastrophic fire that took place here. And with a series of radiocarbon dates narrowed down statistically as best they can, they've got a really strong uh, uh, horizon here, which is dated to basically the start of the Viking Age, the end of the 8th century and the beginning of the 9th. That's when this catastrophic fire happens. And it looks like it was no accident. It's across the entire site. It looks like sculpture uh, of stone was deliberately knocked down and smashed in some cases. Uh, the bits of the crumbled stone reused as hard standing for later buildings. You know, it seems not accidental. The Strange thing about it is that we haven't seen this kind of wreckage on any other monastic site that we know uh, was under attack at this time. Excavations have been going on a few years at Lindisfarne has not shown any trace of this. Uh, excavations over more than 60 years on Iona has not shown any traces of the sort of catastrophic fires and massacres that we know did happen there. OK, so it might be that Viking raids are difficult to see archaeologically. It's true. Uh, but it's also the case that maybe the Port Mahomic example was just uh, one that either went wrong, uh, went too far, you know, uh, killed the golden goose. You know, uh, Iona is raided several times. Uh, this one appears to be raided once. And then the monastery kind of goes out of commission uh, to a certain extent after that. Uh, and so maybe this was a case of where a raid went too far. Regardless of all that, this archaeology, this fantastic bit of investigation and detective work by those archaeologists has kind of colored uh, our perception of the Viking Age, or sort of uh, given uh, uh, credence to those uh, catastrophic narratives of uh, uh, everything's going fine until the Vikings arrive, and then everything shuts down and changes, you know, this real sort of shift from classic early medieval Scotland uh, to the Viking Age almost overnight. And indeed, at Port Mahomet, uh, you know, very famously, uh, the material culture changes after that raid. You know, they start off making these uh, 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 fantastic pieces of Christian metalwork, uh, Christian plate, working glass studs for things like chalices. Uh, and they go from sort of the famous manuscript vellum workshop that was excavated there to making very much secular dress items, weights, 
buckles and rings. And so the character of that settlement does seem to change very quickly in the course of that ninth century. But again, this is one really uh, clear example of this kind of uh, this turn. Uh, the other thing to say about Port Mahomic is that the church actually does not disappear there. The monastery certainly goes into decline, uh, but uh, burial continues. And the same excavations showed that that was the case uh, throughout the ninth to the 12th centuries. And indeed, in the 12th century, the church remained in place and was rebuilt on the same footprint. Uh, as a parish church. And so the sacred core of the site does remain. So even in the case of Port Mahomic, we can kind of tamp down this catastrophic sort of uh, 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 break in, in, in the historical and archaeological record there. Okay. Uh, but the incontrovertible uh, thing is that in the ninth century, you do begin to get this very new kind of evidence, which is in the form of Viking burials, of course, what we call Viking burials. These are burials with grave goods, the bodies uh, of the dead fully dressed and dressed in their best clothing, uh, pinned, their cloaks pinned with uh, uh, brooches and very expensive, elaborate swords and other weaponry uh, and jewelry deposited in the grave. That is completely different from everything that's come before. In Scotland, uh, grave goods have gone out of fashion since the end of the Bronze Age. There's a few bits and pieces here and there in the Iron Age, uh, but really grave goods have not been seen as a practice in Scotland for a long time before the Vikings. And so that is a very clear uh, break. But as we'll see, uh, it's not the whole story of the Viking Age. This is a great map that I've uh, 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 taken from uh, a very uh, useful website. It's just a handy visual. Uh, full credit goes to the Viking Age compendium. There's the URL. Uh, go see it. It's a little bit out of date in some ways, but the gist of it is correct. Uh, the spread, the distribution of these Viking burials uh, shows you roughly where they are in Scotland. And what you see in the mainland of Scotland is very, very little. And we know that Caithness and Sutherland, uh, these places do indeed become part of the sort of uh, Scandinavian dominated realms, the uh, earldom of Orkney. Uh, and to a certain extent, the Western mainland does as well. Uh, and yet, uh, despite the evidence for Scandinavian place names, and uh, 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 we don't have that evidence of Viking settlement. We don't have those longhouses that we get in the Western Isles uh, and on Orkney. Uh, we don't have as many of those Viking burials, and the ones that we do have are very much facing out towards Orkney and Shetland, facing out on the North Coast, with very much, very little else going on uh, further south. Uh, and that triangle that you see at Ballandalloch uh, is a supposed, uh, a, a, a supposed uh, uh, Viking grave, but it's an antiquarian find. None of it remains. And James Graham Campbell and Colleen Beatty uh, kind of dispute that it's uh, a, a real canonical Viking burial even. And so if we take that one out, there's just almost nothing uh, south of the Black Isle. Okay, so there is a Viking age here, but those Viking burials, as iconic, as, as interesting as they are, they aren't the full story. So let's rewind then, and let's take the long view. Let's see what the archeological evidence does and doesn't tell us for the end of the Pictish period and the Viking age. Let's start by sort of reintroducing the Picts here as I mentioned, for true, as this audience will know very well, uh, is based in the area around the Murray Firth, although again, it has expanded across all of what we now call Scotland and has pretensions uh, elsewhere. Okay. They are the leading province. And for true, uh, this kingdom of the north becomes kind of an interchangeable word for uh, the king of Pictland is all, all almost always at this point by after the uh, 8th century, also the king of Fort True. Okay. Uh, and it's very much a Christian kingdom. We have several of their bishops named and documented in the sources. Uh, there seems to be a hierarchy as in a prim epscop, meaning a sort of high bishop or an archbishop, which, uh, you know, means that there's a sort of metropolitan hierarchy here. And so the Picts are sort of in line with Christianity uh, elsewhere in Europe, okay? Uh, so by the by the ninth century, again, they're putting up these great stone arches, palaces, churches, uh, huge monasteries, lots of investment, massive uh, works of art. And, uh, uh, but by the end of that ninth century, uh, the records kind of, blink out of existence, one too many kings, 
killed in battle, uh, specifically in battle against Vikings. Uh, and then by 904, you get the last ever mention of the men of Fort True. And after that, they blink out of existence, replaced, it seems, by a kingdom speaking Gaelic uh, called Alaba. OK, and around that same time is when you begin to get Viking burials in the northern mainland. These are two burials. The photographs relate to one burial assemblage and the drawing here relates to another. These are two sort of uh, uh, very important and very visually striking uh, Viking burials. Great big buckles, something that's not apparently in sort of uh, Pictish uh, 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 milieu of dress. Uh, huge swords, axes, shields left in the grave. Uh, a sickle as well. So there are tools, there are symbolic elements of this. Okay. And then these ringed pins, you can see two of these ringed pins here. We'll come back to those. So that begins to happen around the same time. And so can we connect the end of For True on the one hand and the rise of the Vikings on the other? What's so interesting, I mean, amongst many things that are interesting about that Viking age uh, is that what we have as well in the corpus of Viking burials is lots of female burials in the Northern mainland. And uh, there's when there's been lots of excellent studies of these. Uh, uh, the most comprehensive, I think, has been Stephen Harrison's, uh, who is now at the University of Glasgow. His PhD studied all of the Viking burials from Britain and Ireland in context compared with the burials in Norway. Uh, and Scandinavia. And he's able to sort of take this grand view and sort of say what's the same and what's different. And one of the things that he picks out as being different of the Scottish material is that there are proportionally more female Viking burials, more female furnished burials. And the ones that are in Scotland also tend to be uh, more lavish. And so more women and more women with more stuff than in Norway. And even in Dublin, Viking Ireland has uh, a few scattered Viking graves uh, outside of Dublin and a great big concentration in the Viking town of Dublin itself. And there in Dublin, it is heavily weighted towards men with great big flashy swords, very much more looking like uh, the Viking burials uh, back home in Norway. Uh, and there is a lot of that going on in Scotland as well, but proportionally more women and more women with more lavish grave goods. Here in the Northern mainland, we have uh, just three examples here of this imported material culture that comes with the uh, the new settlers and invaders. These oval brooches or sort of typical of Viking age female dress items. They, there are hundreds and hundreds of them in burials uh, from Scandinavia to Iceland, okay? And they were worn one on each shoulder and they are certainly only made in Scandinavia, on the continent, uh, in towns like Reba. Uh, and, and, and we know that uh, there's none of them made here. So they're certainly imported. Some of these uh, that we have in Scotland are repaired as if they have been worn for a very long time. Some of them are deposited damaged. Some of this damage comes from uh, post-deposition uh, uh, decay. But uh, uh, it, it just shows that these things were passed down and kept in the family for a long time. There were heirlooms, okay? So this tells us a lot. This tells us that the Viking Age wasn't just sort of men on long ships uh, coming here, killing people. Uh, these things were passed down the female line. Men don't own these and gift them, uh, it seems. Uh, and, and, and so these are the kinds of things that tell us that there's a migration. Uh, not just an invasion, okay? And that the in this context, in this sort of new world, uh, if you like, uh, uh, um, the it, women seem to be able to aspire to new forms of power, uh, new amounts of property ownership uh, that maybe weren't available uh, in traditional society in Norway, okay? So that's an interesting aspect of the Viking Age that doesn't get enough play. That's from Stephen Harrison, of course. The other clear evidence for the Vikings is we have the Tarbit Horde. Uh, we have two 
uh, of these Scandinavian style hordes uh, from Scotland. Uh, one of them at Tarbet at the site of the former monastery. Again, that church continues in use and part of that use is burials and part of it is the deposition of this hoard of silver, these arm rings and coins. This is basically uh, a, a kind of uh, the early days of currency, the early days of money in the North, and it characterizes the Viking Age. But the thing that we know from James Graham Campbell and John Sheehan's work uh, is that we know that these hordes are actually not early Viking Age. This is quite late. This is 200 years after that fire at Tarbet. Everything has changed in those intervening 200 years. At this point, we are no longer talking about raiders, or raiders and settlers. We're talking about a settled community uh, of people, people who have been living and dying and being born uh, and raised in what's now Scotland for generations. Okay, So this tells us about the economy at the turn of the millennium. This doesn't really tell us about Vikings. It tells us about the Viking Age economy, uh, a new kind of comedy, uh, economy based on silver uh, before uh, coins, well before coins are minted in Scotland. Uh, this is what it looks like. Okay. That deposit in the churchyard is interesting, um, I think, uh, because the only other of these Viking hordes from the northern mainland is here uh, at Kirka Banks. You can see the little triangle there, uh, 26. On the map on your left, this is, of course, coming from the latest by James Graham Campbell uh, in a recent book uh, that should say 2022, not 2002. Uh, and this uh, is another small hoard of these silver arm rings, a little bit of like a proto currency deposited again in a church, this time even in a little kist. Uh, at a small chapel there uh, in the north coast. OK, so that's interesting, perhaps, that uh, in both the cases of these Viking Age hordes that we have in the northern mainland, both are deposited in churches. It tells us what's changed and what hasn't changed in those 200 years. There is still Christianity. Those churches haven't gone out of use, even though we hear so much about Viking burnings and massacres. Uh, if anything, the church kind of continues to proliferate and expand even under the patronage of Scandinavian speaking overlords. Okay. And that mixture of cultures uh, and ideas is kind of most clearly expressed perhaps in language. This is a great map from uh, an article, the great Simon Taylor put in history of Scotland about place names. And instead of saying Norse spoken here, Gaelic spoken here, he drills down to years and years of experience looking at place names and shows that actually everywhere that you go, there's almost always more than one language spoken at the same time throughout the early medieval period. In some places, like in the northern mainland, you've got several languages. There are traces of Pictish, which doesn't go away. There's Gaelic, probably spoken before the Kingdom of Alba, but certainly thereafter, continuing to expand. And of course, Norse. And these things uh, continue to jumble around so that the map uh, now, as you drive through these places, is this really rich combination of all of these different languages, which is how we're able to create maps like these. Okay, so this kind of study, this study of place names really tells us how we should be looking at the material culture, in my view. Uh, it's never just Picts or Vikings. It's always all of these ideas mingling together. And, and so maybe that terminology of you know, uh, of an early medieval Scotland followed by a Viking age doesn't really help us. I always use early medieval to cover the entire 5th to 11th, even into the 12th century. Uh, that just kind of makes those continuities a lot clearer. OK, uh, let's just go uh, go through this and let's uh, go see what the archaeology tells us. OK, before the Viking age, very clearly, uh, the north, uh, just like elsewhere in northeast Scotland, the most distinctive bit of archaeology, aside from the great hill forts, uh, are the great works of art carved in stone. Uh, by the ninth century, you are no longer getting, as far as we can tell, uh, symbol stones with uh, with no other ornament. At this point, when we get the classic Pictish symbols, they are showing up on these kinds of monuments, these great big carved stones. And they're no longer so much using standing stones 
and marking those. They seem to be quarrying and dressing stones to shape, uh, dressing them down to get these lovely flat surfaces and then carving there. It shows, uh, you know, it shows much experience in stone working uh, uh, and stone quarrying. And these great works of art are sort of unsurpassed anywhere else in Britain or Ireland uh, by the, around the year 800. There's great works of art on manuscripts, vellum, and in metal in these places. But in terms of relief sculpture, I don't think anybody really matches the Picts uh, by the year 800 or so. And in the Northern mainland, you're getting some truly creative, very strange, deeply odd, and absolutely brilliant bits of relief sculpture. If anybody's been to the Rose Markey Museum, you know what I'm talking about. If you've been to the Dunrobin Castle Museum, you've seen some of these. Uh, and and some of these, like Skinnet, are gigantic. This uh, The one at Skinnet is, uh, is uh, over two meters tall, and Hilton of Cadbull, now on display in the National Museum, even with its base cut off, is absolutely towering, okay? So these are great works of art. A lot of these were not knocked down like those at Port Mahomet. A lot of them remain standing. And we know that because many of them, like the one here at Golspie, are reused uh, in early modern times uh, as gravestones. So it, it just sort of calls to mind what people must have thought in the Viking Age, in the Middle Ages, about these ancient stones that were indeed left standing, you know? So they're tangible signs of that Pictish past that never really went away, never really disappeared. And of course, uh, you can't talk about Pictish art uh, without talking about Sueno stone. However, this brings me to my bigger point about the stones. We don't know how to date Sueno stone. Uh, I, I say we don't know how to date it. That's not entirely true. Uh, this does seem to have elements of late, Pictish sculpture because of the parallels that we can draw between other uh, art styles, especially in Ireland, beginning in around the ninth century. So I think it's pretty clear that this is at least a ninth century stone, if not a maybe a little bit later. Uh, but it's certainly of the Viking Age, if you like. But it tells us the kind of money, investment, and just uh, skill that still remains in the kingdom uh, of Fortru, uh, uh, in and around that area uh, at the time of the Viking Age. This has been compared to Trajan's column in Rome. You know, that's the kind of thing that they're aspiring to with this kind of thing. Okay, so even in the midst of that Viking Age, there are still great works of art being commissioned. And there's my point. Um, we tend to see art, the art of the Picts, as one bubble of sculpture, and then Viking Age art as something else. But we don't have a clear Viking art horizon in much of Scotland. We have the Govan School, very famously, operating in the 9th, 10th, 11th centuries, putting out great works of art like the Govan Sarcophagus and the Hogbacks. We have the Whithorn School, which is in southwest Scotland as well, distinctive kinds of cross slabs proliferating across the landscape. But elsewhere, we only have little bits and pieces. In England, we have these lovely crosses that incorporate old Norse mythology into the art, into the Christian art. Things like Gosforth, uh, 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 which are famously these sort of hybrid monuments, sites with hogbacks and things like that. And we only have one of these very clearly uh, from uh, coming from Scotland, and that's a Kilmory uh, that you can see there on your left. You got a sort of Old Norse mythology uh, below and a crucifixion above, this sort of mingling of styles. Uh, there's another bit of sort of uh, Old Norse mythology on a cross from Iona. Uh, but that is a stone that seems to have been carved and brought into uh, from the Isle of Man. That one's a mystery. Um, so I'm leaving it out here. But there's other ways in which Norse uh, art styles and traditions creep into Christian art. There is a, a, a what looks for all the world like an Irish style, Iona style uh, cross uh, recumbent stone uh, there from maybe the 11th century or the 10th. And it's got this lovely runic inscription naming Scandinavian named people. Okay, and there are art styles uh, uh, from Scandinavian art that are imported into stones like this on Isla. Uh, but we do a disservice by sort of saying this is Pictish art and this is everything else and only calling that everything else Viking because it's absolutely not the case. Some things very clearly are this new world. Uh, and these, these two crosses uh, from Thurso kind of exemplify that. There's very few runic crosses uh, from Scotland, all told. 
some along the West Coast and some up here. Uh, but these two, two from one site, is currently uh, uh, currently unique in terms of uh, crosses that are certainly uh, funerary memorials. Two on one side is rare, so Thurso uh, becomes very important indeed. Uh, 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 but the thing about these is that, again, we can't simply call these Viking sculpture because where these things can be dated by their lettering and art style, they are indeed 11th century, perhaps, maybe even 12th century. Uh, in, in the case of that uh, that cross. Uh, but what's interesting is that it's found covering a kist. And again, that uh, Kirk of Banks hoard was found in a kist at a chapel and a kist with this runic cross over it. That's another interesting thing as well. The long kist, the stone-lined burial, is absolutely emblematic of uh, early medieval burial in Scotland. The Picts do it, the Britons do it. Uh, but it goes out of fashion in around the 8th century or so. Uh, it's something that people stop doing, except out in the north and in Orkney and Shetland. Uh, that's where this sort of the kissed burial does indeed continue. So again, the sense of things uh, changing. Uh, and again, just to support that late kind of date for the Thurso cross, that sort of expanding arms uh, uh, style of cross uh, and the little sort of loopy things on this Bursay cross kind of link it to the sort of uh, uh, mammon style to me uh, that is being used in in, in, in in Swedish runestones at the time. And you get one of these at Bursay, which we know was the Bishop's Palace from the 11th century there on Orkney. So that helps us date this kind of sculpture. And the stones at Thurso, I, I, I I feel this is more 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 vibes based on the date of those runes, but I feel like these kind of belong to that generation of uh, you know Norse speakers, runic writers who are patrons of the church. You know, this is a different world from the Viking Age, and so uh, and the larger point is that basically Viking art just does not uh, cover it. Uh, Christian art continues in stone throughout Britain and Ireland in the 9th century, 10th century, and 11th century. And in some places uh, here in Ireland, you get these great works of art, uh, like this cross slab as late as the 12th century, still continuing these sort of early medieval modalities. But there at Kilfenora, you can see these elements of sort of Ernest style, Scandinavian style art blending into that Christian art and runes here at this one at uh, Killaloo. So uh, these things kind of blend rather than sort of stop abruptly. And in places like one last map here in Northwest England. This is a pattern that you see almost everywhere in England, uh, where there's very few concentrations of sculpture, like great big crosses at Sandbatch in Cheshire, uh, and these great sort of high crosses at monastic sites. Uh, this is Cheshire and Lancashire that you're looking here uh, from the uh, Corpus of Anglo-Saxon Sculpture volume. And then after the 10th century, after 920 or so, as it's stated here, this proliferation of crosses across the landscape. This is the sign of local churches being founded. This is the precursors of the parish church model, where there's a church in every village, you know, accessible to everyone. That's a sign of the church not sort of falling back uh uh, uh, falling away from use, but the church actually expanding and becoming more central into everybody's lives. And yes, even Scandinavian speakers are converting to Christianity, are endowing churches just like local lords uh, are doing as well. So this is happening all across the Viking Age, uh, and I don't see why Scotland should be any different. All of that is just to say that some of the dates that we give on crosses uh, uh, in, 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 in Scotland might need a bit of revision. So we know, for instance, that Pictish styles of art, like this classic example from Phallus Wester, are indeed taken forward and copied, mimicked in places like Mockold uh, on the Isle of Man, okay? So we know that styles are copied and reproduced over time, you know, so that when we see Pictish crosses like this, sometimes they're very easy to date on art style, like Phallus Wester, clearly a Pictish example. And then we see copies taken forward later on, okay? And it strikes me that there are ringed crosses and relief crosses in Scotland, like here at Ray, um, that sort of call forward the proportions are a little bit different from those classic, very geometrically well laid out 
Pictish crosses. And that calls forward to me more like the Whithorn style crosses or the brilliant, huge ringed crosses that you see at Margam Museum in uh, in Southern Wales. OK, I think Ray and others on the mainland, which we and a knee jerk reaction, we call them Pictish. Uh, because they're sort of carved in relief and with interlace. Some of these might just be later and might even be post-Pictish in some cases, case in point. At the museum itself, museum where I work, we have this bank of Pictish crosses, the church in Pictish areas. And what I love about them is that some of them have Pictish symbols and they are clearly of that sort of Pictish era up to and including the ninth century. If we take those Pictish symbol uh, stones out, the clearly Pictish ones, we're left with these weirdos in that bank of sculpture. There's at least three crosses on there that I think are very likely to be 10th century or maybe even later you know, based on the style of crosses. Here at Monifith and Abernethy, you have these crucifixions. Those are the legs of Jesus uh, with two spearmen there at Abernethy. And you can see the legs of the crucified Christ. Uh, the heads of these crosses have been lopped off, probably in the Reformation, but maybe not. Uh, and here at Ray, you have an example of a cross that its head has fallen off at some point in the early medieval period, because you can see that it's been chiseled back. You see all those little pock marks on the stone. It's been chiseled back to create this really funky, uh, 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 stubby armed cross. So at some point within the early medieval period, and I think quite late in the early medieval period, this stone has been reworked to keep it in use as a cross slab after it's been broken. There are just weird things like these. And I think we can think about Ray. It kind of keeps coming up. There's even stranger things at Ray. There's this weird cross in the middle of the road that you wouldn't call Pictish. You wouldn't really know what to call it. <laughs> You know, it's just a, a stubby, plain cross. But cruciform stones like this with no other ornament tend to be later in, in the Scottish chronology where you find them. Ian Fisher has established that there may be 11th and 12th century uh, in Orkney and in the Isles. Uh, and so why not uh, in Caithness and Sutherland as well? You know, and so basically we have these great works of possibly uh, Viking Age art being put up at the same time as those Viking burials that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. I think the interaction between these two uh, bits of evidence, the sort of clear pagan Viking burials on the one hand, and the, continu the continuity of uh, patronage of sculpture, and the fact that these Pictish crosses uh, that were carved before the Viking Age remain in place. I think the interplay with these two things is too interesting to let go of. And I think it just needs a lot more eyes and needs a lot more work. Okay, for the last part of this talk, then let's get to the treasures uh, in the museum, the stuff that I've been uh, uh, sort of pouring over at the museum for the last few years. I want to draw attention to how difficult it is to actually just say what's Pictish and what's Viking Age about this stuff. And here's a really good example. At Acrevo uh, in Dunbeath, we have this great example of a classic Pictish brooch handed into the Society of Antiquaries, uh, acquired by the Society of Antiquaries at the end of the 19th century. And only a hazy account of its find survives. But it's very clear that it was a complete brooch when it was found. It was discovered while cutting drains. The mattock has gone straight through this thing. And sadly, the other bits of it haven't survived between its discovery and the time it was acquired by the Society of Antics. So it was a complete brooch. It would have been the most brilliant example uh, of its kind outside of, uh, you know, outside of things like the Hunterston brooch, which survive elsewhere. This is one of the sort of great works of gold filigree studded with amber. Absolute masterpiece would have been worn by kings, queens, you know, uh, uh, that kind of thing. OK, but what's interesting is if you go back to Anderson's write up in PSAS, he quotes this letter from the finder who's trying to remember the details of what it looked like. And he mentions that it looked to me as if it was placed on a fine sash of leather or cloth. So it's got organic material. It's either wrapped in something or it's attached to a bit of clothing. Either way, this is not just a stray find. It's either in a hoard wrapped in textile or it's pinned to a cloak as if worn by a barrel. And I think in either case, it's almost certainly taking us into the Viking Age, into the ninth century, uh, rather than before. And I'll show you the reasons why I think that. Uh, further in this description, he says, there's something similar to a cross, and that's not clear whether he's talking about the ornament on the cross or whether there's other objects. 
but then the last sentence, a great deal of other articles attached to it. Again, it belongs in a context with organic material and with other objects. I think this can only either be a hoard or a burial. But certainly, I think that takes us into the Viking Age, despite being this great example of Pictish art, you know? Uh, and, and I think a lot of the finds from this area relate to that. Is it possible that it's a Pictish burial? We do have works of gold and amber filigree on brooches and pins in Viking burials. At West Ness, uh, a woman's burial, the most elaborate woman's burial uh, from Orkney is from West Ness on the side of Rouse. And amongst other things, she has this great brooch pin of gold, silver, and amber pinned, uh, it seems, to her cloak. So it is possible that one of those things was pilfered or retained and used in a burial in the course of the ninth century. Otherwise, the kinds of pins that you see in those Viking burials are these kinds. These are the ringed pins. And whenever you see one of these, you're in the Viking age. It turns out that they are an Irish kind of dress fastener in origin. But it's one of the things that once the settlement of Viking Dublin is founded, they're attracting metal workers from far and wide to start making things, mass produce them uh, uh, compared to how they were made before, make them by the dozen. And one of the things that they pick up on from the locals is this style of dress fastener. And this becomes the Viking uh, fashion in Britain and Ireland. And it gets exported to Norway and to Iceland. It becomes fashionable even in the homeland, you know, and in the colonies, as it were. But it's something that originates in the Viking Irish Sea Zone. And what I love is that by the time we get the very first, the earliest Viking burials that we can date in Scotland, sites like Westness, sites like uh, uh, Kniep on Lewis, they're already adopted this dress item as their dress fastener. So they're already this sort of hybrid dress fashion. They're not just sort of bringing Norse fashions over here. They're adopting, they're creating something new. And that's when we see the Vikings for the first time, they're already something different, something different than they were when they left Scandinavia uh, 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 and, and incorporating ideas from both sides, not just imposing one culture upon another. When Tom Fanning uh, last wrote these up in 1994, he had 61 ring pins of various kinds from Scotland. And thankfully, through excavation, responsible metal detecting, lots more finds since then, my latest count is we're up to something like 130. So we have doubled the amount that uh, Tom Fanning knew about. And you can compare uh, the map, uh, and his map on the left is only of one kind of ring pin, but it's the most common kind. It gives you the kind of distribution, uh, 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 the sense of the distribution as it was then. Okay, if you put them all together now, you see there's a lot more from the north and west, but there's a lot more from non-Scandinavian parts of Scotland as well, including a big cluster in Elginshire, okay, in the Murray Firth area. Uh, as far as uh, uh, sort of Aberdeenshire, you're getting these stray finds of ringed pins. And if you put them in a heat map, you can see very clearly the weight of them is still very much uh, where you'd expect the Northern Western Isles, but you've got these clusters emerging in the Southern Lowlands and in the Murray Firth at the head of the Great Glen. So what's going on with these? Are there more Vikings than we think about sort of roaming the East? Maybe, I mean, almost certainly there's place name evidence that suggests that, but also the timing of these things is odd. The Viking hordes, as I mentioned, were sort of Viking age, but late in the 11th century. And some of the ring pins Tom Fanning has established are of late dates as well. They're not all of the 9th century. Most of them are actually 10th century. And some of them continue to be used into the 11th century, but only in Britain and Ireland. They continue to develop in Scotland and in the Irish Sea Zone. They become what Gaelic and Norse speakers in Britain and Ireland wear by the 11th century. It's these types with these kidney rings where you can see the ring is becoming fatter and fatter until it doesn't even move and it's not even a, a functional ringed pin anymore by that point, okay? And it's this kind of ringed pin, the later kind of ringed pin, the 11th century crutch head kidney ringed type. Those are the ones that we're getting in the Murray Firth area and in Aberdeenshire for, in large part, okay? So again, Viking Age, 
but not Viking. At this point, Alba has been Gaelic speaking for a long time. And the connections with the Irish Sea are basically the connections of co-language speakers. It's uh, a sort of Gaelic speakers connected by the Great Glen as they uh, as they have been uh, 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 for centuries. Uh, and so at this point, these, these pins shouldn't really be called Hiberno Norse, Hiberno Scandinavian. Uh, this is just how Gaelic speakers dress. And so maybe there's no surprise that we're finding more of them out in other parts. And then just to draw attention to what little find, but I think a significant one, there are these bits of green porphyry tile that show up dotted around Scotland and Ireland. But in Scotland, they really belong to sites that are dated to 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, the Viking Age. And they actually only come out in places that are dominated by Scandinavian speakers like Orkney, the Hebrides, you know, the west of Scotland. Uh, that's mostly where they're coming from. There's two from the Longhouse settlement, the trading settlement at Bornish in the South East. You know, um, and one from Whithorn, one from the Brock of Bursay. You know, these uh, 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 and a lot of them are coming from chapel sites. St. Ninian's Island, Shetland is another one. Uh, and there's one of these, uh, and this is what they relate to. Uh, these are portable altars that are being made, deluxe portable altars, where that tile of green porphyry uh, uh, um, is this exotic stone that takes a really nice polish. It was used in sort of Roman architecture, early Christian architecture in Carolingian churches, it becomes popular again. And these little portable altars use these tiles. They take them from sort of uh, 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 mosaics and wall decorations, and they make them into these little altars where the green porphyry tile stands in as a miniature altar. Now, we don't have any complete examples of these tiles, uh, these portable altars from Scotland or from Ireland. But we have these little bits, and they're always in these little bits. And so uh, uh, there's lots of theories around these. Are they, you know, curiosities picked up by pilgrims? If so, I think we would see more different kinds of polished stones. We'd see much more mosaic tiles. We'd see much more marble. We'd see much more sort of curios like that coming back. And we don't see that. We only see these little chunks of green broken tile. So somebody is sort of supplying these to Scotland and Ireland, you know, there is a pipeline uh, and, and there is a demand for these little tiles. And because a lot of them are found on church sites, we can believe that they were seen as sort of Christian, maybe even like little relics, you know, little amulets, uh, but they were acquired through trade sites. So there's one from Whithorn, there's several from Dublin, there's two from Bornish. So these are trading settlements as well as uh, Christian sites. And so I think there are these little curiosities. The one from the Northern mainland, is just here. Uh, it's number two, Moorland Mound, Caithness. This is what it looks like. It's a bizarre place. It's been called a cashel. It's in the middle of a bog, basically. But you see, it's got this wee burn running through it. Okay. It's called the Kirkstones. When it was found, it was referred to as the Moorland Mound uh, to differentiate it from the other mounds uh, uh, that Lang was excavating at the time. And you can see his engraving of what it looked like. You know, it's just uh, bog by that time. But it's got these crazy stone structures, these little square structures with paving and paved sort of entrances uh, leading into them. Uh, they don't look like churches or chapels to me. There's entrances from the east where the altar should be. They're square. They're very strange. Uh, the finds don't really suggest anything except maybe a broadly medieval origin for these, but basically we don't know what they are. Uh, and the porphyry tile comes from, I believe, this one, uh, number three here. Uh, this is a watercolor done in 1916. Uh, and so we don't know what those are. Uh, any questions and suggestions uh, on a postcard, please. The last bit then, to round this all off, let's go really deep into the hordes, because this is where the evidence really shines. And I'm not talking talking about these. Those Viking Age hordes of silver are typical of the Northern and Western Isles in Scotland uh, from the 10th, 11th uh, century, but we only have two of these from the mainland. Uh, what if we look at hordes from before that? Uh, uh, oh, and, and I should I should point out as well that there is now, uh, uh, there's been a, a recent find of one of these. That's the clipped end of one of these silver armorings, heavily tarnished, that you see there on the left from Dornick. And it 
sort of uh, it joins other sort of uh, Anglo Scandinavian uh, finds from Dornick to suggest that Dornick is uh, a port at this time that is trading with the sort of rest of the Viking world and uh, ports further south. Uh, you know, that Anglo Scandinavian bell is really indicative of that sort of 10th, 9th, 10th, 11th century uh, time period. So Dornick is emerging through responsible metal detecting as an interesting sort of port site. The, uh, 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 and so there's more of these silver bits to be found, is the point there. But there's uh, even just calling these Viking hordes doesn't really help us. This is a type of Viking hack silver they get in sites famously now like the Galloway Horde. This map is a distribution of those kinds of arm rings with that stamped decoration on them. These Hiberno-Norse arm rings are only found uh, basically in Ireland and in Northwest England with only sort of scatters elsewhere. Okay, this is very much an Irish Sea and Dane law focused uh, trade item. So even though we have all this Viking settlement in the Northern and Western Isles, that is a different silver economy than what's being used here. So even calling them Viking hordes doesn't do justice to all of the mixed character of these things, okay? And so we do it to service by calling them Viking hordes, but also the opposite, the native hordes, isn't helping us any either. The Viking hordes, because of their all this shiny silver, they get all this great sort of work on them. We call them all sorts of things. There's payment hordes, tribute hordes, saving hordes. We attribute them to blood feud. We say there's Odin's law with evidence from sagas of people burying hordes of silver. But the native hordes get left out of this because they're weird and less shiny. When we talk about native hordes, we only talk about them as Pictish hordes or metal workers cash or just ah the vikings are coming let's throw everything into a hole and forget about it but that notion of a native horde and a viking horde again is blown up by recent discoveries like the galloway horde elsewhere this is a site where you have that hacked up silver of the classic sort of viking age irish sea zone but the complete undamaged ornaments of these quote-unquote native hordes and there at the galloway horde we see these coming together in a way like never before to suggest that you know, it's neither a Viking nor a native horde. It's neither. And I think maybe none of them, maybe those words are not helping us at all. Um, I've done this quite complicated chart, which I'm just going to skip through here. But these are the Pictish hordes from the 9th and 10th centuries, all laid out according to a couple of characteristics. And this is just to say that there are some aspects of hordes before, during, and after the Viking raids that kind of carry through. And that is the deposition of brooches and complete objects that are not hacked up, okay? Some of these through lines run through. And, and so again, there's more to be said. There's more continuities there, despite the fact that most of the literature goes to the Viking hordes and much less to the quote unquote native hordes. And that image of these things being thrown into a hole quickly in advance of Viking raids also doesn't bear out this is the St. Ninian's Isle Horde, very famous Pictish brooch horde, lots of bowls, lots of silver, very carefully packed up and stacked in a wooden box and not stashed in a secret place. It was marked not by an inverted cross slab, but by a face up cross slab. And this cross slab was placed directly behind where the altar would have been in the chapel of St. Ninian's Isle. This was a known place. This was an offering maybe, uh, maybe the church's treasury, but it was not a secret. If it wanted to be found, it would have been, you know, uh, and for some reason it wasn't, okay? It was never retrieved, uh, but maybe that was uh, where it was supposed to remain, you know? So this image of this as a horde stashed in the face of incoming Viking raids doesn't really tell us the full story, and there's a more interesting story that we could tell there. But it does belong to the series of quote-unquote Pictish hordes, that do belong to the ninth century. There's three uh, hordes, uh, three uh, silver brooches that are found uh, of elaborate kinds from Cluny near uh, Dunkeld. Uh, this last one that you can see on the top right found much later than the first two and in a broken state, which means that maybe the plow or other work has damaged and dispersed what would have been another one of these classic uh, hordes. So there's probably more to be found there uh, at, at, at Loch Cluny. 
uh, and again, in the heartland of uh, 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 southern Pictland. Another lost one from the Brock of Burgar, again, in a prominent place, not really a secret place. Uh, and, and Loch Clooney is argued to be a power center at this time as well. A really elaborate one, uh, written up by James Graham Campbell. In his description, silver combs, silver pins, silver brooches, amber, gold. I mean, there's some strange stuff going on here, but an elaborate one. Uh, uh, and he dates this to the sort of St. Ninian's Isle era. Uh, do you know? Uh, um, and so this is fitting into a pattern. Okay. And there's one of these great ones from the Northern mainland as well. It doesn't get as much recognition, uh, but it's the Rogard Horde, complete brooches, two of them, classic examples of Pictish types on display in the National Museum of Scotland. But what is less well known, and this is described very, uh, very well in a great blog uh, on the NOSAS blog uh, on the origins of the Rogard Horde. It was found uh, while building a railway in the ninth century, 19th century uh, through Sutherland. Uh, and it was apparently as many as nine or even 11 brooches. But as soon as they come out of the ground, they start being sold off or melted off or gifted away. And very few of them survive. The two best ones acquired eventually by the Society of Antics. Uh, some others go down smaller and clipped uh, uh, examples go down to the Ashmolean Museum. Eventually, one of them, a teeny tiny bronze one, uh, is still on display in Dunrobin Castle. Okay, and the rest of them gone to history. But we know from the Ashmolean collections that there was more than just brooches. There's also these, which are not Pictish. These are Northumbrian or Anglo-Saxon uh, strap ends. The ornament on them is very interesting. It kind of looks like the glass studs on chalices, like Daring to Flan and things like these. And they belong to other similar strap ends that are found in almost overwhelmingly in Scotland, uh, Viking Age contexts. One from the, a pair from the West Ness burial, which has that very similar circular uh, design, and one from almost certainly from a Viking burial as well, from Ray in Caith Ness, and one along the road in Perthshire, basically on the uh, A9 head north. Okay, so when these are found in Scotland, they are they tend to be Northumbrian, so Northern British, uh, and in Viking contexts. And so the Rogart horde, by including some of these brings us straight into the ninth century, if not the late ninth century as well. So despite the fact that it's scattered and lost, I think we can put it into the sort of mainstream of these late ninth century hordes. How late are we talking about? One of the hordes that has one of these great examples of strap ends is the Talnatri horde. And this one has coins. So we can date it very well to about 874, 875 around the time when the Viking Great Army is rampaging across the north. And we know raiding parties extend as far as Pictland and Strathclyde in 874-875. Okay, so the Talnatri Horde seems to relate to this kind of activity. There are silver coins here, including the first imported Arabic coin found in Scotland. We are very much into the late 9th century here, around 875. What's going on in the north in 875? We don't know. That's the point when the last of the people to be named as a king of the Picts dies. Uh, uh, and at that point, for about 25 years, we don't hear anything of what's going on in Pickland. The annals just kind of go quiet. Uh, no records survive. And then when they blink back into existence around 900, we get uh, kings of Alba. And so this is the time when things kind of go dark. A little dark age within the dark ages, this little 25 year period. Uh, and I think uh, because of the link of those coins and those strap ends, this really belongs to the world of the Viking great army further south. And we don't have to assume that the Viking great army is coming up north for every one of these hordes, but it is a testament to the disruption absolute disruption that is being caused in power vacuums, kings being killed, uh, uh, regimes being changed that we know is going on even uh, in Pictland at this time. And if you want to read more about uh, the great new archaeology of the great army, uh, books like these are kind of really shedding a light on that sort of time period. And then the Talnatri Horde has this really distinctive object included in it, which is a coin pierced 
for wearing. And you can see a little bit of the little silver mounts uh, and that silver rivet still attached to it. So this would have been suspended and worn as, I don't know, a bracelet, a necklace, a little pin or a badge, but it was displayed as if to say, uh, we have access to the good silver. We have access to these coins. So they're coins, but they're not used as money. They're used as sort of uh, tokens of display. And that takes us to our final hoard today, the Croy hoard. This is uh, another kind of unloved uh, 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 hoard, uh, uh, one of these native hoards, a metal workers hoard it's been called. But it's from right here in the heartland of what was for true. Um, it's in between basically Berghead and Inverness. You know, it's on the road uh, in between these places in the heartland of very important sites. Rosemarkey across the water, Berghead up the road, Sueno Stone further down, uh, Urquhart and other sort of uh, uh, hill forts that are probably occupied still around this time. So we're talking in the heart of power here, uh, uh, proximity to power. And it contains a weird mixture of things, but again, including those Pictish brooches, which brings it into that mainstream of St. Ninian's Isle, Rogart, Clooney, uh, and now Croy. So this belongs to a sort of ninth century pattern of deposition. Okay, it's got beads, a weird collection of beads, but there's also beads in other hordes, including uh, the Galloway Horde now. So there shouldn't be any surprise that it's a mixed deposit, uh, including amber beads. We saw that there were amber beads in the lost Brockabergar Horde and that silver chain and a couple of other things. So again, the brooches, very typical of this time. One nearly complete, missing its pin, uh, and the other two broken, maybe in antiquity or maybe upon retrieval. It's hard to tell. But I think in its original form, this is probably another one of these uh, brooch hoards. Okay, these are brooches of a kind that we know are current. Even in the Viking Age, there's one very similar one in copper alloy found in Scandinavia. There's more than one, uh, really. And, and so we know these are floating around at the time of the Viking Age. The silver chain, there's more complete examples. The one in the center is the one from Croy, broken at both ends. But we have complete examples, uh, one with a bead attached at the Truhiddle Horde called a Scourge, uh, and one Ballin Abbey, which is more clearly attached to a bead and pin, so a dress fastener. I think that's probably what this series of objects really all is. Uh, I know that's quite controversial with regard to the Truhiddle Horde, but no time to talk about it here. All, uh, all we need to know is that these things are also floating around in the time of the late ninth century, uh, as seen in these other deposits and in the Croy Horde from around 850 or so. So we know these things are floating around. And again, like at the Talnatri Horde, these distinctive pierced coins perforated at two ends in that distinctive way to be worn as if on a necklace or on a bracelet or some other distinctive way. Uh, and that, I think, you know, even though these coins date to the first half of the ninth century, I think they belong uh, to the kinds of deposits that we see in the late ninth century. And the reason I think that is not just because of the Tal Natri hoard, which you see, which you've seen already here in the bottom right, but there's also not one, but two of these coins perforated at both ends in that distinctive way, now found in excavations at Berghead, just up the road from Croy. And both of the ones from Berghead are coins of Alfred the Great, which is, again, a late ninth century, very much embroiled in the Great Army period. So what are these coins of Alfred doing at Berghead? What are these coins doing traveling up north? And they're being displayed in this distinctive way. We don't know, but there's other Anglo-Saxon deluxe material ending up at Berghead. There's a famous drinking horn that's now, uh, the mount of it is, is on display in the National Museum in Edinburgh. And then there's these coins and there's other Northumbrian coins that have been found in the most recent excavations by the University of Aberdeen. Okay, so there's actually a lot of interplay now between Berghead in the time that we don't have any records of the Kings of Picts and what they're up to and the time of Alfred the Great, again, struggling against the Vikings. And it's possible that maybe there's an undocumented kind of attempt to reach out and sort of ally with strong kings of the North. Uh, or maybe there's raiders amongst the Picts 
who are bringing these treasures back up north on successful raids. Either way, it's completely undocumented. These are stories that we haven't told uh, of the end of Fort True that the archaeology is only hinting at. And as if that wasn't enough, there's even an antiquarian find that this was pointed out to by Mark Blackburn in a lecture uh, a, a, a while ago. These are all the sort of coins of Louis the Pious that were known to him uh, uh, um, around that time. Okay, and only one of them is pierced in that distinctive way. And this one was apparently found near Elgin. And so there's another example, you know, looking at old finds, it's really useful, actually. Uh, and you're finding this pattern. And so there's something going on that seems to be focused on for true, except for that little outlier uh, at uh, Tal Notri. There it is, zoomed in there. Okay, the final interesting thing about the Croy Horde is this balance beam. We have these balances. We know the Vikings weighed silver and coins in equal armed balances, handheld balances. Uh, there's a great set, a complete set from a Viking burial, Kaloran Bay in Collinsey, complete with its weights. Okay, and so this balance beam uh, in the Croy Horde indicates, okay, maybe this is a Viking horde after all. You know, it's got these distinct notches uh, on the right side, though, that kind of tell you that it's something different. This is actually a steel yard. These notches are like the sliding weight that you get at the GP. There's a, a bar and a counterweight, and that tells you what, what the weight is. That is very rare for the Viking Age. Steel yards are incredibly rare. And with this little distinctive inward-looking animal, it doesn't look very Viking, actually, at all. It looks more like house-shaped shrines, another insular Christian material culture. There's only very few of these. Uh, that I've been able to find at Ronald's Way on the Isle of Man, sadly from an undated context. There's another one of these steel yards, again, with these vertical notches and with animal heads, but this time pointing out, complete with its little lead counterweight in this case, but sadly, again, undated. The only one that is from a sort of context is from a ninth century Viking boat burial uh, in Norway. And again, the little notches, the inward facing animal heads, this is the most complete version of what the Croy balance would have looked like. Okay, those are the only three that I've been able to find of this distinctive form. And one of them here at Croy is the only one that can actually be dated by the presence of those coins to around 850. Okay. And the ones from Haug, that boat burial and Croy are very similar, not just in the back turned heads, but also that they have the same amount of notches cut into them as if they're weighing the same kinds of things. Okay. So this is definitely taking us into the ninth century. And I think safe to say the late ninth century. And the last incredible thing during the pandemic, we photographed these things for uh, uh, the new book that I was writing, Crucible of Nations. And when I was packing this object away, I turned it around, noticed some weird markings on the back, looked at it under a microscope, and they were runes. I thought, okay, we're clearly in the Viking age here. We're clearly a Viking object now. But when we gave them to our friendly uh, uh, runologist at the University of Wales, David Parsons, he confirmed to me that these are indeed not Scandinavian runes, but Anglo-Saxon runes. And they seem to incorporate the word for way or weight, or maybe the weigher, you know, it's a label saying that that's what this balance scale is. And sometimes runic inscriptions are just simple labels like that. Uh, uh, and, and so it fits into a pattern there. So Anglo-Saxon coins, Anglo-Saxon drinking horns at Berghead, uh, and now this balance scale, which we associate with Vikings, but with an Anglo-Saxon runic inscription. Basically, we don't know what's going on with all this. Why is this stuff coming to Berghead? And there's lots of stories that we now have to tell or retell looking at that evidence. Uh, and then again, if we're looking at this as a simple story of picked to Vikings, we're missing out on a lot of the color, a lot of the narrative. And I can just end with the example of the Galloway Horde. Again, I talked about these as Viking age trade items, these arm rings, but very famously, they also have runic inscriptions on them. And in this case, we know that they are also, again, Anglo-Saxon runic inscriptions. And so is this a Viking Horde? Is this a native horde? Those terms don't really help us anymore. And I think in the northern mainland, we are seeing that in just so many different ways. Uh, I think that's kind of the best thing we can do is just kind of complicate these things uh, and sort of tell some new stories, go back to the drawing board and say, what really is going on? And can we tell something a little bit uh, uh 
more interesting, messier than just sort of picks the Vikings. Okay, uh, there you go. Further reading for you. Thanks very much. And uh, see you later. Happy birthday, Nosas. Thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs>